Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Race to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. 2 Samuel chapter 2 David anointed king of Judah. After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoram and Jazareel, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and they there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul, David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord, because you show this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and bury him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Ish Bosheth made king of Israel. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, told ish the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim. And he made him king over Gilead and the Ashrites, and Jezri, and Ephraim, and Benjamin, and all Israel. ish Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. The battle of Gibeon, Abner the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul went out from Mahanim to Gibeon, and Joab the son of Zeruiah. And the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Then they arose and passed over by number. Twelve of Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and the twelve of the servants of David, and each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called Helkav Hazarim, which is at Gibeon. And the battle was very fierce that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. And the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Ashhal. Now Ashhal was as swift of foot as a wild gazelle. And Ashhal pursued Abner. And as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Is it you, Ashahel? And he answered, It is I. Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left, and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Ashahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Ashahel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear, so that the spear came out at his back, and he fell there and died where he was. And all who came to the place where Ashahel had fallen and died stood still. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. And as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amma, which lies before Gia 
on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on the hill top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you know how that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? And Joab said, As God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the men stopped and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight any more. And Abner and his men went all that night through the Araba. They crossed the Jordan, and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants nineteen men besides Ashahel. But the servants of David had struck down Benjamin three sixty of Abner's men, and they took up Ashahel and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. Chapter 3 Abner joins David. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinamah of Jezreel, and his second Chiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. The third, Absalom, the son of Machal, the daughter of Talmai, king of Gashar, and the fourth, Adonijah, the king, the son of Hadith, the fifth, Shabbatiah, the son of Abtal, and the sixth, Ephium of Ekla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine, whose name was Mizpah, the daughter of Ai. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and not have given you into the hand of David. And yet you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Bathsheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, to whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. And he said, Good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require you, that is, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth and Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michal, for whom I pay the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband Partal and the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Maharim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return, and he returned. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about, for the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the land of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with twenty men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel 
to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you. And that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Just then, the servants of David arrived with Joab from Array, bringing much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the army that was with him came, it was told Joab. Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away, so that he is gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you, and to know you're going out and you're coming in, and to know all that you are doing. Joab murders Abner. When Joab came out from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner. And when they brought him back from the sister of Sarah, but David did not know about it. And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Afterward, when David heard him, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, kill Abner because he had put their brother Asahel to death in the battle of Gibeon. David warns Abner. Then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes and put on a sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed the bier. They buried Abner at Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not feathered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. Then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was yet today. But David sworn, saying, God, do so to me, and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as if everything that the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner, the son of Ner. And the king said to his servants, do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I was gentle today through anointed king. These men, the sons of Sarah, are more severe than I. The Lord repays the evildoer according to his wickedness. Amen. The following is the English translation of Pastor Martina Fon's teaching on the book of Second Samuel chapters 2-3, translated by Bryson. Read the Bible every day so you will be full of faith. Let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapters 2 and 3. After Saul's death, there was no longer anyone to prevent David from ascending to the throne of Israel. Saul's youngest son, Ishbosheth, was the only one who survived, but he was a fearful and weak leader. Saul's death also brought some chaos to the leadership of Israel. David could have taken advantage of the situation to seize the throne, but instead he prayed to God, seeking his guidance on the next step. This demonstrates David's wholehearted obedience to God in every step. He didn't only seek God's guidance when he was being chased and in danger. Even now, when the situation was favorable, he continued to seek God's direction. This is something we should learn from. So in 2 Samuel 2 verse 1, it says, After this David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. Hebron is located south of Jerusalem and is a central area in the tribe of Judah. In verse 4, we see that the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah, where they told David, It was the men of Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul. David was anointed three times in his life. The first time was by Samuel in Bethlehem, anointing him as king. 
The second time was here, anointing him as king over the tribe of Judah. The third time was in Hebron, where the elders of the twelve tribes of Israel anointed him as king over Israel. We see that David didn't ascend to the throne by killing Saul with his own hands. He fled from Saul, continuously escaping until he finally ascended to the throne. God himself dealt with Saul so that this time David became the king of the tribe of Judah. Israel consists of twelve tribes, so at this point, God only gave David the promise of ruling over one twelfth of the kingdom. You know, at this time, the men around David were brave warriors. They could have said, why only one tribe? David, now is the time. Let's attack the other tribes. You are the chosen one, and you have God's promise. Let's do it. But we know that David did not do this. Instead, he sought God's guidance, and God instructed him to go up to Hebron. David's seven-year reign in Hebron was also a test. During these seven years, although God's promise for, was for David to be the king of Israel, he patiently and faithfully obeyed, even though what he received was only one-twelfth of the promise. One-twelfth doesn't seem like much. This shows David's heart. He simply wanted to obey God. He never aspired to be the king of Israel for his own sake. I believe it was his mindset that led God to make him king over all Israel. David's greatest interest was to understand God's will and to know God's beauty. This is the biggest difference between him and Saul. Here we see that God's promises and God's timing are two separate issues. We may think that when the time comes, everything will be fulfilled at once, but God fulfills his promises step by step. Waiting for God's promises requires a lot of patience. David taught us a secret. If our hearts are not focused on merely obtaining the promise, but on seeking God wholeheartedly, then we will find ourselves much more patient with every promise. This is something I really need to learn. We should ask the Lord to help us so that our eyes, hearts, and emotions are not set on the promises He gives us, but on God Himself. Then we will be completely free. Additionally, we will see that David, besides being upright, obedient, loving God, and generous, he was also very wise. In verses 5-7, to seven, we see David showing goodwill toward the Benjamites for the first time, indicating that he would not seek revenge. This is significant because, as the saying goes, the winner becomes the king and the loser becomes the outlaw. Typically, when a new king ascends, the former king and his family often face extermination. In verse 4, it mentions that they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord, because you showed this loyalty to Saul your Lord and buried him. It is important to note that when David said this, the men of Jabesh Gilead were still supporting Saul's household. Despite this, David thanked them for their loyalty to Saul, God's anointed. He also encouraged them to be strong and brave in difficult times. By doing this, David was sending a message to the other 11 tribes. He would not seek revenge like others might. The men of Jabesh Gilead were likely surprised because they had previously pursued David, yet he came to bless them, thank them, and praise them. This was a very wise diplomatic move by David because the entire nation was waiting to see how he would deal with these associated with Saul's household. His act of kindness alleviated some people's suspicions, anxieties, and fears. You must understand that Saul had treated David as an enemy and sought to kill him. But honoring Saul, David was sending a message to the eleven tribes that he did not intend to seize the throne by force from Saul's family. Next we see in verse 8, Abner the son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim. Abner was Saul's cousin and the army commander. Mahanim was located east of the Jordan River at the border between the territories of Gad and Manasseh. This move was made to keep Ishbosheth away from the Philistines effectively placing him in a position where he could not protect the western side of the Jordan River, including territories like Asher, Jezreel, Ephraim, or Benjamin. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigns two years. But the house of Judah followed David, and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. If you calculate this, you can see that Ishbosheth's reign as king probably coincided with the last two years of Saul's reign. David faced two main obstacles in becoming the king of all Israel. The first was the eleven tribes that had appointed Saul's son, Ishbosheth, as their king. The second was external threats, particularly from the Philistines, who had recently defeated Israel and Saul. Interestingly, the Philistines did not interfere with David's reign over Judah. They might have been observing from a distance, thinking, let the two kings fight it out. During this period, David waited quietly in Judah for seven years and six months. He did not start any civil wars to claim the throne. By this time, he probably understood that everything was in God's hand. As mentioned earlier, being king was not his greatest desire. His greatest desire was to love and know God. Since God had already placed on him the throne of Judah, he would also ensure David ascended to the throne of Israel. From 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 to chapter 3, verse 1, Abner had traveled from Mahanim, east of the Jordan River, to Gibeon on the border of Judah, to assert his authority. 
Joab went to intercept him, which led to the beginning of the civil war. These events occurred during the last two years of David's reign over Judah. In verse 14, the word play or compete actually means combat. Abner and Joab might have wanted to minimize casualties and propose a small scale of combat instead of a full-blown battle. However, both sides ended up falling and the conflict escalated into a full-scale war. In verses 18 to 23, Asahel was killed by Abner. Asahel's death planted a seed of hatred in Joab's heart, leading him to seek revenge. This is really unfortunate because Joab had been with David for a long time. God gave David two opportunities to kill Saul, but David, out of reverence for God, refrained. Joab, however, failed to learn these lessons and allowed hatred and bitterness to fester within him, which is truly a pity. Because of this, Joab and Abishai pursued Abner until Abner called for a ceasefire. In verses 30-31, to 31, we see that in this conflict, David's servants lost 19 men, plus Asahel making a total of 20. However, David's servants killed 360 men of Benjamin who were with Abner. This battle marked the beginning of a prolonged civil war as described in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. During the seven years and six months that David reigned in Hebron, he spent most of the time waiting patiently. He did not initiate any attacks against the house of Saul, which is why it is referred to as the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, not the other way around. David never attacked Saul's house. Verses 2-5 to record the sons born to David in Hebron. Three of them are particularly important. Amnon, his firstborn, Absalom, his third son, and Adonijah, his th- fourth son. These sons later caused significant trouble and conflict for David's family and kingdom. In verse 6, it mentions that during the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had gained considerable power in Saul's house. From verse 7 onward, we see Abner's ambition. Abner took one of Saul's concubines, which was a significant act. According to the customs of the time, a new king would inherit the former king's concubines. Therefore, Abner's action was not just a moral issue, but a declaration of his interest in the throne. Ishbosheth, of course, confronted Abner about this. Abner became angry because Ishbosheth was merely a puppet and a weak leader. In verses 9 and 10, Abner swore an oath, saying, God do so to Abner and more also if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. This indicates that Abner always knew it was God's will for David to be king over all Israel, yet he had resisted, propping up a puppy king in Mahanim, east of the Jordan. In verses 12 to 16, we see David's second act of goodwill toward the Benjamites. Abner sent messengers to David, offering to make a covenant to help bring all Israel under David's rule. David agreed, but set one condition that Abner bring Michal, Saul's daughter, to him. This was significant because it represented David's desire to re establish his connection with Saul's house. By reclaiming Michal, David would strengthen his legitimacy to one day become the king of Israel as he would be recognized as Saul's son-in-law. In verses 17 to 27, Michal was brought back, and Abner made a covenant with David, supporting him as king. However, when Joab learned about this, he was very displeased because he harbored a grudge against Abner. This grudge was one reason for his anger. Another was that Abner, being a highly capable commander, posed a threat to Joab's position as David's chief commander. In verses 28 to 30, upon hearing about Abner's murder, David prayed that the guilt of shedding blood would fall upon Joab and his family. Previously, the killing of Asahel by Abner had occurred during the battle at Gibeon. Abner had acted in self-defense after repeatedly warning Asahel to stop pursuing him. Asahel refused to stop, forcing Abner to kill him reluctantly. Joab, however, murdered Abner in Hebron, a city of refuge, in a premeditated act of revenge driven by his own personal motives. This is why David declared that the guilt of the bloodshed should rest upon Joab and his family. After Abner's death, David demonstrated great wisdom and extended a third act of goodwill toward the Benjamites by mourning for Abner. In verse 31, Then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed the bier. They buried Abner at Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. These actions showed Israel that Abner's death was not sanctioned by David therefore easing the hostility from the northern tribes. In verse 35, David further demonstrates his sincerity by fasting until sunset, saying, God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. 
This public act of fasting made the people even more convinced of David's innocence in genuine mourning for Abner. They were pleased with David's actions. In verse 38, the king addressed his servants, saying, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? David recognized Joab's personal vendetta, saying in verse 39, And I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, the sons of Zeruai, are more severe than I. The Lord repaid the, the evildoer according to his wickedness. You have to know, David's response to Abner's murder could have caused significant unrest in Hebron, but his wise actions in honoring Abner helped unify the nation once again. So you can see how crucial the wisdom and the example of a leader are. David indirectly communicated to everyone that he did not order Abner's death. Through his mourning and fasting, all the people followed his lead. By doing so, he sent another message to the tribe of Benjamin that he did not seek revenge and that Abner's death was not his intention. At this time, David was only 30 years old, yet in the political maneuverings, you can see that he was full of God's grace and wisdom. Dear family, whether you are in the political arenas or in the workplace, where you often see scheming and deceit, it is important to love and obey God and look to Him in all things. This way you can be under God's protection and be filled with His wisdom and kindness, treating everyone around you in such a way that your team will come into greater unity because of you. What David did serves as an excellent textbook for leaders. The people around David viewed the other 11 tribes as enemies, remembering how they had been pursued and tried to kill them. They did not want to befriend them, but David said, No, we must honor them. We must treat them well. We need them. David was essentially telling his followers that the personal stories of injury were less important than God's intentions. Protecting God's kingdom was more important than personal grudges. We can see that David applied the principle he learned in the first chapter, viewing Saul with God's perspective, treating him kindly and honoring him. He used the same principle when dealing with the remaining 11 tribes, especially the tribe of Benjamin. By doing so, he brought unity. In the fifth chapter, we see that the entire nation came together as one. Dear your family, I believe God is asking us whether we prioritize unity over the friction caused by our differences, over things said or done that may have hurt us or our families. When we look at God's kingdom, are we willing to bring our hurts, our lacks, and our wrongful treatments to God? Do you believe that God knows and cares? If we are willing to let go of these things for the sake of God's kingdom, how pleased and joyful God will be. Moreover, I believe our God is a righteous God. If we rely on His strength, since on our own it might be very difficult, but if we rely on God's strength to let go, our hands will be empty. Do you believe? God wants to give us more. When we act this way, the blessings that came upon David will also come upon us. Amen. Dear Bible Race viewers and families in Christ, thank you for watching our videos. We hope our sharing can enrich your life. If you find the content helpful, we hope you will support our ministry so we may continue to produce high quality videos to serve the kingdom of God and hope to bless more people's lives. You can donate in the following ways. Online giving by PayPal. If you are residing in Taiwan, you may also donate by bank transfer. Thanks again for your viewing and support. Every contribution is our greatest encouragement. We sincerely appreciate your support. May God bless you abundantly. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.